This program is presented by WGBH Boston in co-production with KTEH San Jose. Enterprise is co-produced with Learning Corporation of America. In 1981, the Oakland A's won the Western Division title in the American League. Fans flocked to the stadium in record numbers. The new owners of the team were flying high. But winning can't be guaranteed. You've got to make money, win or lose. That's the name of the game. This week on Enterprise, Hardball. I'm Eric Severide. From spring training until the World Series in October, the daily fate of baseball teams affects our well-being more directly than most acts of Congress. As a public institution, the sport is flourishing. A baseball team will receive more media attention than a head of state. But as a private business, which it is, baseball is floundering. Most teams are not self-supporting. Owners rely on other business interests to keep their team on the field. This week on Enterprise, we'll watch as the new owners of the Oakland A's prepare for their sophomore season. It's lucky that their other business is Levi Strauss because they'll have to dig deep into the pockets of their jeans to develop and market their team. Even then, they'll need luck. This is an industry that one former owner called too much of a sport to be a business, too much a business to be a sport. The fans on their feet. The A's bench jumping up with every pitch. Beard has retired the three men he's faced. The 2-2 pitch. Fastball struck him out. Swing. Beard has struck him out to end the ballgame. Baseball is a funny business. Each season has its own life. Only two years prior to this pandemonium, these stands were nearly empty as the A's finished in last place. But in 1980, two critical changes occurred. Fiery Billy Martin was hired as the A's 10th manager in the last 12 years. And later that year, the Haas family, owners of Levi Strauss, bought the A's from Charlie Finley for $13 million. Wally Haas, director of the Levi Strauss Foundation, became executive vice president of the A's. His brother-in-law, Roy Eisenhart, an attorney and law professor, became the A's president. Neither man had ever worked in professional sports before. When I was a little boy, I used to go to the ballpark whenever I could. And I'd sit there and think, what can I possibly do when I grow up that would get me out here every day and people not consider me a bum? Well, my dream came true. I just never thought the ticket would cost us so much. I wake up in the morning, and if we won the day before, everything is great. And if we lost the day before, I don't want to see the newspaper. I don't want to get up. I mean, the whole physiological effect on me uh, of a win versus a loss is very measurable. As winter rains drench the Oakland Coliseum, the last vestiges of 1981's triumphs are washed away. The new year brings a clean slate, no wins, no losses, and the first order of business is signing players to 1982 contracts. You don't expect me to be able to write my name clearly. After all of the mental stress you guys put on me. Eisenhart signs catcher Mike Heath to a new contract. Keith and his agent, Joe Garagiola Jr., have been negotiating with the A's for three months. They finally come to terms on a two-year pact worth about $200,000 a year, twice Heath's 1981 salary. Garagiola asks A's attorney, Sandy Alderson, for one last clarification. Sandy, explain to Mike, although I kind of indicated to him, what, what the club has in mind with this clause about weightlifting except for the purpose of muscle development. Well, I guess we're more concerned that uh, that Mike begins to use his weight training not so much as a training vehicle for physical endurance, but rather as a cosmetic uh, effort um, to perhaps attract a, uh, a suitable endorsement of some sort. Heath's contract also restricts his participation in other sports uh, that might cause injury. Mike, you'll be happy to know that you can play a racquetball with protective eyewear in place. I don't know if you've ever used all racquetball glasses, do you? Oh, yeah, I do, okay. every time I play. All right. Now we can play racquetball. Can't 
yeah, what, <laughs> as long as he wears his eye guard. <laughs> his eye guard. <laughs> Not all contract negotiations are this easy. The A's might have to go to arbitration over the salary demands of two of their biggest attractions, outfielders Dwayne Murphy and Ricky Henderson. Alderson hopes there's a chance of settling with Murphy's agent, at least, before today's 11 o'clock cutoff time. It's sort of a last-ditch effort on our part. Frankly, it's not a realistic expectation. Sandy Alderson. The call is from Dwayne Murphy's agent. The reason I called and the reason I, uh, I guess, conveyed some sense of urgency to your secretary was that uh, uh, I wanted to find out uh, realistically at the last minute, I guess, whether or not there was some way we could uh, settle the Murphy case. Uh, well, let me tell you what I have in mind, and I'm not going to beat around the bush because I don't think we have time to do that. Uh, and I don't expect that you will uh, uh, try and... Uh, respond by a series of approximations because that's really not my my intention i think you and i have had enough conversations to know that that's not my style uh and i suspect it, it it's not yours either uh we would be prepared uh to compromise this at uh, a base salary of somewhere between uh 330 and 340 thousand dollars uh, with incentives that would take Dwayne up to what I realistically think is your number, uh, and that is uh, um, between 380 and $400,000. Steve, uh, we got 10 minutes, okay? Okay, I'll be here. Bye. Eisenhardt is quickly apprised of the details. The agent has countered Alderson's offer by asking for $350,000, plus incentives based on achievements such as selection to the All-Star team. My recommendation is that we uh, accept. All right, let me give you my feelings. I think our original number of 300 was high. I think that number was used and leveraged off to get us into this situation. Now we're at a $50,000 more base salary than what was already a high number, which is effectively about a, a 15 or 16 percent augmentation. Um, on the other hand, my motive of not having the player feel alienated still exists and is very strong with this particular individual. Um, I would agree to the base of 350 if the incentives, uh, not including postseason championship play incentives, don't exceed 400,000. You know, in the aggregate, in other words, don't exceed 50,000 additional. Do you think that's doable? I think it is doable, yeah. Go to it. Uh, Steve, Sandy. Okay, I talked with Roy, and we are prepared to accept the uh, the 350 base figure uh, if you will agree that the incentives, based on regular season versus postseason, in other words, excluding the LCS and World Series. Uh, most valuable player uh, awards um, would not exceed fifty thousand dollars. What are you asking me, Steve? Okay, well, I, I guess I've got to ask you again. Do we have a do we have an agreement or don't we? Okay. Okie doke. Yeah. Bye. When deals are struck with all the players, the A's payroll reaches $6.3 million. To offset just this one expense, they must sell one and a half million seats, more than they've ever sold for any one season. Baseball teams used to rely only on winning and weather to draw crowds, but the A's would rather put their faith in modern marketing and advertising. 
Marketeer Andy Dolish joined the A's last year after working for professional soccer, basketball, and hockey. All of our marketing, sales, and advertising is based on our product, and our product is uh, affordable, entertaining, uh, exciting, family um, involvement at the ballpark. Last year, we came out here and surprised an awful lot of people, and Billy predicted that we'd have the good year that we had, and he's predicted that we're going to go to the World Series this year, and he's been right over the last two years, and I'm not going to be one to uh, doubt his predictions this year. He walks off the first base, cool and slow. Everybody in the park knows he's going to go. Billy Ball. Dolish recognized Billy Martin as an advertising asset. The players were not well known in 1981, but Martin was an established drawing card. Dolish played that card with every hand, building a million dollar ad campaign around the slogan, Billy Ball. Billy Ball, A's baseball. A reserve seat, please. Right. Oh. And I suppose you came out here just to sit in your hands. Uh, no, okay. I... Okay, well, Armis is up, three and one. Let's hear it. Uh, hey, go, Tony. Come on, talk it up. Out of way, Tony. Let's hear some chatter. A uh, way to watch him, Tony. Come on, come on. This guy's got nothing, Tony. Make him pitch to you. That's not an okay. arm. That's a noodle. Okay. That's a... We'll give you a tryout. Martin's personality was so well known that even a spoof could be appreciated. He's out, Billy. Gosh, Ron, from the dugout, it sure looked like he held up in that pitch. <laughs> he swung, Billy. Hey, of course, you have a much better vantage point than I. You want to appeal it? Go ahead. That won't be necessary, Ron. Your word is good enough for me. If you said he went around, I'm sure he went around. My mistake, my mistake, my mistake. Billy Ball, it's a different brand of baseball. Everybody is going to be waiting. What is going to happen this year? And it's got to be better than what happened before. In February, Dolish and Eisenhart meet with their agency, Ogilvy and Mather, to plan the 1982 ad campaign. Because if whatever we touch this year falls short of, in fact, doesn't exceed what we did last year, people are going to say, aha, the A's are cutting back. The A's aren't doing as well this year. The A's were a one-year or a one-night stand. And yeah. that's why we're having this meeting is because I, I want to get across to everybody the message that we have to do it better this year. Not just on the field, that's not controllable. But. Eisenhart's gentle urgings for a new and different campaign are met with some resistance by account executive Graham Kirk. Kirk believes that the format of last year's ads will still be effective. There's a feeling that the consumer is tired of what they're seeing and hearing, when in fact, a lot of companies tend to tire of things before the consumer tires of it, and, and probably even before they garnered all of the all of the things to be milled from that. The agency's presentation to Eisenhart includes several tongue-in-cheek Billy Ball ideas. Non-commercial. So before, and like Graham was talking about, what it is is a glimpse into uh, a situation like the umpire talking to Billy uh, that you can see from afar, and if you didn't have the soundtrack on, you'd think that uh, it was just a conference at the mound. Billy comes out and says pretty seriously to McCaddy, you tired? McCaddy seems to be bothered by something. Uh-uh, look. Remember Leave It to Beaver? What was the name of Wally's best friend? And everybody sets in trying to think of the name of Wally's best friend. One guy guesses, oh, sure, you know, the wise guy. Another guy says, Lumpy, that's, it's Lumpy. And McCaddy says, no, not Lumpy. And Billy just finally kind of goes, you mean Eddie Haskell? Starts back to the dugout, and we get McCaddy up close. Eddie Haskell. It's it's Eureka experience. And then we sort of pick up a couple of the infielders as they're spreading back to their positions. And uh, McCaddy's getting ready to go back to work. And one guy just shrugs, says that. So he's the manager. And we cut away to the tag. Billy Ball, it's a different brand of baseball. Is the fourth one this same type? It's, like, you know, uh, uh, I mean, you have a fourth one, right? Mm -hmm. Is it the same? I want to save some time. Uh, is it the same concept? Because I want to address the concept. Okay. All right. Um, it's similar in the in the sense that it shows one of the players in a in a situation. It's, it's sort of an inside joke. It's something that yeah. we know about. That's what worries me a lot. It's just more of the same. You know, it's it's now we have six ads of of inside 
looks at the A's of warmth. And uh, I just feel as though we want to go beyond that. I think we want to come up with something that's a little more uh, innovative and maybe something more abstract. I would like to extend the image uh, this year, extend the perception of the A's organization by virtue of these ads. This doesn't do it. It just repeats it. It's just reiteration of the same thing. That's the way I feel, okay? That's the client talking. Yeah. <laughs> And that's not to be a limitation on you at all. It's just a, no. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Eight hundred miles from Oakland, in Phoenix, Arizona, the A's six million dollar cast is in rehearsal. Spring training has begun. Arizona is home for five major league teams each March. The desert echoes the boyish joy of hundreds of grown men, suddenly excused from winter and told to go out and play. Bring it! Bring it! <laughs> oh, you just hurry in your body, Billy, and your arm can't get up. The A's are investing heavily in player development. Over $4 million, a quarter of their operating budget, is being spent on scouting and minor league operations. Haas and Eisenhardt feel that the only way to sustain success is to build a strong farm system to feed the major league team. One established player they've acquired for 1982 is former Dodger second baseman Davey Lopes, here giving pointers in base stealing to rookie Tony Phillips. And it's just like this. That's all. And that means you're ready to go back if he tries to pick you off. You see? You got good balance to get back that way. Play clean, play hard, give no ground, ask for no ground. This feel out here to an infuse is a matter of pride. Billy Martin runs the show. Eisenhart and Haas give him nearly free reign to bring young players through the A's system. He has 100 ball players on the spring roster the largest training camp in baseball history. If you see in between, you walk to third base. If it's right at the guy, you gotta stop. But you know where they're playing. In other words, you don't run and say, where are the outfielders? You made up your mind before knowing where the outfielders are. Once you set your mind up all these things we're talking about, then the toughest problem in this game is hitting the fielder. This rest of it becomes easy. Arizona is also the spring training home of the San Francisco Giants. The Giants were well established in San Francisco when the A's moved to Oakland from Kansas City in 1968. Both teams draw from an estimated two and a half million baseball fans in the San Francisco Oakland Bay Area. On any given day, uh, the Giants and the A's are not competing head on head when we're at home there on the road so that uh, there's not much competition there, but we do compete for uh, for space in the newspaper, on the television, radio. Um, and uh, we do compete for the entertainment dollar for people who have to spread it pretty thin. This competition brings A's saleswoman Doris Messina into the heart of Giants territory, San Francisco's Union Street. Our full plan is called the Grand Slam package, which you'll see on here. And that relates to the full season ticket. The A's previous owner sold only 300 season tickets in 1980. The new owners increased that figure 12-fold to 3,600. But they still have a long way to go to rival a team like the Los Angeles Dodgers, which sells over 25,000 season tickets a year, banking over $12 million before the first pitch is thrown. You bet your life it's a bargain. What form of entertainment can you go to that is still only $6? So I make it out to the Oakland A's? Make it out to the Oakland Billy A's. Mark. No, and not even me. <laughs> Make it out to the Oakland A's. Okay. And we're looking at... 456. 456. There you go. I love it. Hi, this is David Rubenstein with the Oakland A's. How are you? Oh, we're doing real well. We haven't lost a game in about five months, as a matter of fact. And, uh, sales director Rubenstein heads a force of 40 salespeople working on commissions of 8%. They sell season tickets door-to-door -to, -door to businesses throughout the Bay Area. 
They meet once a week to discuss their progress. What is the biggest obstacle that, that you're finding out in the marketplace right now? I mean, Can't get to the guy that writes the check. But that's always the problem, you know, the guy that, that writes the check. But I want to know if there's anything out there now that's different than that's out of the ordinary. Is there anything that's happening now, whether it be the Giants or whether it be... I, I don't want to make it sound sexist, but they do have a lot of women in positions that make certain types of decisions that, that are hard that to educate, that are hard, well, it's true, but it's hard to educate them about how men use tickets as, as, as well, good. What's the problem? No. Oh, okay, well, what's yeah. the problem? Who's he calling them? Is he calling them the right person? Anytime a person's in a position where they make the decision whether a company buys tickets or not, that's the right person. And you try to explain in there, it's a blank wall. I, I don't know whether, you're not getting to the right person. That's true. true. The question then is, how do you get to the right person? How do you do that? I don't know. I can't. There's no generic answer to that. Yeah, I mean, you can just be creative. I mean, okay, but you're still not getting. So you go back to that sliding door and you say that sliding window and say, "I went to talk to Donna, and I'm not sure she knew. I wasn't explaining myself properly to her. Who else can you suggest that I see?" Stand by, please. Here we go. Thank you, Freddie. Roll tapes. You never leave it to Beaver. What was Wally's best friend's name? Meanwhile, in Phoenix, the Leave It to Beaver commercial is produced after all. Eisenhart deferred to the agency after another round of meetings. But a completely different ad, based on Eisenhart's desire for a baseball nostalgia theme, is also being developed. Action! And one, and two, and three, and four. That's why he's the manager. Better, please? Come on, that's the best one so far. Very good, Bob. But he's very introspective, looks down a lot. Very little eye. Billy Martin is not happy about dividing his time between baseball and advertising. But he is an accomplished actor. Let's run it again while we're hot. Come on. Oh, boy, they're going to love this. <laughs> when it comes to the complex problems of baseball, who's better than Billy Martin? It's driving me nuts. What's wrong? Remember Leave it to Beaver? Oh, sure. What was Wally's best friend's name? Hey, what's up? Lumpy? No. What is this? Well, his best friend and again, lived. they may be discussing how to pitch to this big Boston pinch hitter. You mean Eddie Haskell? Well, I guess they've got the game plan. Right? That's why he's the manager. Billy Ball. It's a different brand of baseball. Back in Oakland, season ticket sales are winding down in late March. How many people did better this week than last week? <laughs> Who's, uh... Get, get your hands up. Who's, who's over $500? Who's, who's over 1000 2000 Losing too many. I think this is where we, they start dropping. 2500 Yeah. $3,000. Ouch. $3,800. Good, goodbye, CJ. Uh, $4,000. $4,800. What'd you do, Doris? 81.76. Doris Messina had a good week. Others weren't so fortunate. My personal resources are being strained. <laughs> 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 but all in all, I, I feel that we're going to make a spurt and all cross the line with a lot of money and a lot of sales. If you've got people that you think you can close, you've got to get out and close them. Because we are we're coming to the end. And we've, we have got to go these next three weeks and really punch it. The A's host a party for season ticket holders and VIPs. Over 6,000 season tickets were sold, putting $3 million in the bank, a near doubling of last year's results. The opening game is sold out in advance. The players arrived from Phoenix last night. The 1982 baseball season is about to begin.
The A's won the opening game after an 11 inning struggle. But they continued struggling throughout the season. Everything went wrong. They finished in fifth place, 25 games behind. But the show at the Coliseum still attracted fans. A record 1.7 million people spent $7.5 million to watch the A's play. They outdrew a contending Giants team by half a million fans, despite the A's inferior record. Our product is not just the Oakland A's or the Oakland A's won and lost record. Our product is baseball. And it's when you lose sight of that that I think you get into trouble. So uh, we, are, we continue to sell baseball. We can still continue to sell exciting baseball. And that's uh, simply and clearly uh, our unitary product. The A's theory that winning isn't necessary to draw big crowds proved correct last year. Their marketeers performed better than their players. But because they invested so heavily in promotion and player development, they still lost nearly $5 million. Eisenhart and Haas don't expect to break even for at least four or five more years. And the A's will not be playing billy ball anymore. Martin was fired last October. Eisenhart cited philosophical differences, and two years of advertising became obsolete overnight. But the seasonal nature of the baseball business provides for new beginnings. October frustrations give way to April dreams, and the glory is once again there for the taking. This program was a co-production of WGBH-TV and KTEH San Jose, which are solely responsible for its content. Enterprise is co-produced with Learning Corporation of America.